Caius World Radio, and I'm your host, PJ Boston. We are ripping through Welcome to Sky Valley, the incredible Caius record from back in the day, 25 years ago, if you need it. And we are doing something now that I can't even believe it. I'm so stoked. We've had a lot of, a lot of big wigs on our show before, but I've never had someone this cool. Ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to welcome Chris Goss into Caius World Radio. Chris, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, what's going on, man? Hey, man, I really appreciate it. Um, we're just trying to celebrate... Uh, you know, 25 years of Sky Valley. Yeah. Uh, how's it, uh, does it seem like 25 years ago or five minutes ago? Uh, it's a tough one, man. <laughs> um, it actually seems like 50 years ago. No kidding, huh? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was a, a lot of incarnations of a lot of different people and uh, and years gone by, you know. I mean, we, we started recording that in 93, I believe. And uh, it came out in 94, correct? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so, yeah, um, 25 years, it, it depends, man. You know, it, 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 go, it seems like it goes by so quickly on one end, and then, you know, depending on what you're going through, it could, you know, life's either a party or a crucifixion. So, you know, depending on which side you're on at that particular moment, you know. No. Now, you said that thing was recorded, some of it was in 93 and the rest in 94. How does it work like that? Because back then, you couldn't do what you do now and just record, you know, um, at home or email the stuff all around and everything. Uh, that was done at Sound City, too, correct? Correct, yeah. Now, that was uh, Blues for the Red Sun you did at Sound City, too. Yeah. Was was Blues the first one you did at Sound City? Yeah. Yeah, I, I had had so much fun and good luck working at Sound City with my own band that uh, when I hooked with Caius, I wanted to bring him there. And uh, and just because, it, it, to me, it was the best sounding studio that I, I'd ever worked in. And and the vibe was perfect for, for the band as well. You know, it was a very loosey-goosey place. Um, you know, kind of run down and... and like you're in your friend's basement. That that's what it was like, you know. Like your your hangout in your friend's basement. Even though it was a big studio with great old equipment, uh, the vibe was, um, you know, a lot of newer studios in the '80s started to look like Darth Vader's living room. You know, very, you know, black and high tech. And if you if you you know spill your drink on the ground or you know put your if your cigarette ash at the ground, like a robot's gonna come out. And, you know, kill you kind of, kind of vibe. But Sound City wasn't like that. It was uh, old shag carpeting and um, and tile floors. That and that's all I can compare it to is like you know the closest thing to a 1970s hangout basement at your friend's house, and with with the best old gear in the world you could possibly want, literally. So you know, I, I had a great time there recording. Um, the first and second master's record and uh so when caius came along I, it was natural to to bring them to a to a space i was familiar with and um they were lucky actually that they got to work there because it's a a, a page out of history now and they got to make two really good records there that that's a uh that place was magic huh like the the movie Absolutely. and the... yeah i mean the amount of it didn't matter, like you know, who who you talk to, whether it be Tom Petty or Ronnie James Dio or Mick Fleetwood or Stevie Nicks. Everybody loved that place. You know, what I mean, like it, it didn't matter what level someone was on, everyone felt comfortable there, and its funkiness. And so, if you were a down to earth person, you know, and made down to earth music, like everybody I just mentioned did. Um, then you felt an affinity for it. You know, it, it wasn't a pretentious, horrible, ugly, high-tech, you know, modern-looking place. And, uh, you know, you it was an American classic place, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and there was a vibe in the walls, you know, that... Uh, and it has a lot to do with the, 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 the spirit and the heart of the owner of a studio. You know soaks into the place and uh you feel welcome 
and you know you're greeted with a smile when you walk in and uh and not some snob you know at the front desk or something and so it it was that that kind of feeling and and when you're with friends and and Caius were friends at the time um you know it was it was just fun i mean we would walk in laughing all the time you know that the best rock records are made under those circumstances where it's loose and it's it's a lot of fun to do wow and um it's a whole different ball game now you know people sitting in front of a computer screen and uh half the bands watching you know videos on youtube or whatever and and the whole vibe has changed since computers took over and uh, and we were working on tape back then as well and and that's a whole different ball game as well you know you have one shot when you have just a couple of tracks left on the 24 track tape and um you know you 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 can't takes weren't disposable as they are now you know you could do 15 guitar solos on pro tools now and uh, right and you know keep them all and decide which one you want to use and it's bullshit, you know. You back then, you you, you did a, a take, and if you didn't like it, you went over it, and it was gone forever, pretty much. And uh, maybe you did two takes and got to put one good solo together out of two takes at the best. So I, I'm I'm a person who likes limited choice like that, you know, where you've uh, you've given it a really good shot. Now decide, make up your mind, and and then move on and uh, pro tools is only uh you know kind of reinforced neurosis in the studio and uh, too many choices and too much junk to hang on to so uh it was a really good time to record and um the the end of the tape era really you know the 90s and by by 98 i think yeah you know it, it Pretty much all the studios in L.A. were were probably Pro Tools by '98 or 2000, and uh, you know, goodbye tape machines. You know, crazy. Now, do you do you think that you at the time had any idea, like especially for the blues record, that what you were making was like magical, like it would live for so long? And did you did you have an inkling that there was something special there? Yeah, yeah, I knew I exactly what was going on. Um, the the moment I, I first heard Caius and one, heard them live, let's say live, because actually my wife had been playing a cassette. I lived in Hollywood at the time, and um, and Caius's management had given her a cassette. And I think this is around the time that, that they were recording Wretch with their managers producing at that time. And... Um, and it was, you know, they, their their sound wasn't really fully realized by, you know, their, their producers and their managers at that time. But they, I, I'm not sure the cassette that she got, whether they were demos for Wretch, they probably were. And, uh, and so I really didn't know them, but she kept playing the tape. And I, uh, my first instinct was that John sounded like Danzig quite a bit. Okay. And I was label mates with Danzig at the time on uh, Death American. And and so, yeah, obviously there was a Misfits connection you know, to Caius. But um, she kept playing it over and over again and began to grow on me. And, uh, and then we heard they were playing and at the Gaslight, a bar in an alley in Hollywood on Selma or off of Selma. I forgot the name of the alley, but uh, it literally was an alley, and um, and that was it. So I had to see them once. Chris Cocker was still playing bass at the time, and um, and that's it. Um, you know, sold. I think there were you know maybe five or ten people there, and um, but the, they were tuned down so low, which no one was doing at the time. Now it's quite commonplace. But it, it it was lower than a B, but not quite as low as a C. They didn't use a tuner. It was a, a quarter tone that Josh had in his head that they would tune to all the time. 
and which is odd to begin with. And then, so uh, the the strings were so loose and flappy on the bass and on the guitar, actually, that it created this really unusual low-end sound wave in front of the stage. And I'll never forget it. it I, I felt the same feeling that um, that I felt when I saw Black Sabbath or any of the, the, the English metal bands when I was a kid, that same kind of scariness that, um, you know, a really dark, low end and, and this swinging. And uh, Brant swung when he played drums. And, and I'll, I'll never forget that feeling. You just know. And I, I think it helps when you're a music producer or even a songwriter that knows when you hear something that a lot of people are going to love it. You know, you just know because you like it so much and what it's doing to you feels so good that you know that a lot of people are going to feel the same way about it. And that's, I, I knew at that moment that, okay, you know, th- there, there's something here to be reckoned with and, um, and I've, I've got to get my hands into this so no one ruins it. That's, that was my fear because, you know, um, Metallica and Megadeth and very staccato metal was very popular at the time where it's very, very tight and there's silence in between, very fast picking. And, and what Caius was doing was, very, was slow and swingy and, and like, you know, lava. It really, was like more molten, organic. You know, and uh, and you know, it just kind of plowed you over with this this low end wave, and uh, that along with really good riff writing and the great singer, uh, it was undeniable. And so, I uh, I thought, okay, I've got to record this because some rock producer, you know, like. I'm not going to mention any names, but Mr. Rock will get his hands on this, make these kids tune up and and make it really tight and make them play to a click track and, and you know, and just ruin it and just turn it into fucking, you know, and turn it into what everyone else was doing at that time. And it would have ruined everything. So it really was a labor of love for me and to... to to just like record them, you know, like they they before someone else fucked it up, which would have happened. Oh yeah. And uh, it's Hollywood, you know. And uh, I've seen so many people who who have great things get torn apart, torn to pieces by A and R people and and producers who listen more to the the label than they do to the band. And uh, so I, I really couldn't let that happen to something that was so lovely and 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 heavy and it had so much soul to it so uh yeah and the the rest is history yeah um and that's it well you i don't you, know if that answered the oh, question i don't ab- even know what the question was now no you you absolutely answered it so so you you saw them in the alley did you pursue them or did they pursue you um sounds like you chased them down i let's see um I think Josh's dad had the first master's record, something like that. Um, I, I don't know if they knew who I was, to be honest with you. And, um, and then, you know, I was kind of, it, it, at that time, I was like riding a pretty good wave. Um, yeah, I would, the, the first master's record and was really well received. And then, then Ginger Baker joined the band and then we were, you know, even upped about ten notches after that. So I was I was having a really good time at that time. And so then I think when they found out, you know, what I was doing and what I had done, and they trusted me. And um, and that's what it comes down to is, you know, the band trusting the producer and the producer trusting the band. So I think you know we were uh, equally impressed with each other and. It was the laughter, I think, that uh, of, of especially you know blues and Sky Valley, that in the studio that was so profound that um, 
you know, um, I'll, I'll never forget the when I was recording the first Masters of Reality record in New York City, uh, we were doing drums at Atlantic Studios. Atlantic Studios in New York City was a famous studio near Columbus Circle near Central Park, and um, and it had, rec- you know, the people who recorded that over the years was just the history book of rock from Aretha Franklin to Cream, you know, it was like ridiculous. Wow. And... Um, so we were recording drums for the Blue Garden record there. And simultaneously at that studio, Keith Richards was mixing his first solo album, Talk is Cheap. And at the, at the time we were recording the first Masters record, the band wasn't getting along. And we had split into two factions, and the vibe wasn't that good. And um, Rick Rubin kind of enjoyed the fact that the band was at odds with each other. He kind of you know, enjoyed watching that kind of conflict go down and thought that maybe the, the tension would help the music or whatever, but, you know, that's bullshit. But in any case, um, I wasn't having a very good time. I just knew that we'd been signed by the biggest producer in the world to the hippest label in the world and, you know, Def Jam at the time. And uh, But so out of the misery of my sessions, I would around 7 o'clock at night, Keith Richards and his band would come in, and they were doing some last-minute overdubs during their mixing. And I would hear laughter come up the elevator in the hallway at Atlantic Studios. The studio was on the second floor. And the elevator doors would open, and Keith and the drummer Steve Jordan and the guitarist Wadi Wattel, um, they would all be hanging off each other, like they just went out for dinner and drinks, and now they're coming into work around seven at night, and they were laughing and having a great time walking into the studio, and coming out of the room of misery that I was in, and then seeing that, I it it, it was probably the most profound day of my life in the music business, because I thought that's how you make a record. When I saw them and the way they walked in and and the the fun that they were having and and at that point i I also in the back of my head said, "You know if, whenever I make a record again, that's what the vibe's going to be and and that was it and and that's what I wanted to bring to Caius was that that same kind of vibe where you know, look what you're doing for a living here. I mean, this is a gas. You know, nothing to be mad I mean, about. You know, you're 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 grooving for a living, and uh, or you can. They weren't quite making a living yet, but you can, and this is how you do it. You know, and uh, so yeah, they were they were really good times back then, and um, you know, up until of course, and the circus leaves town. We kind of all knew it was over by that point, and. Um, so the vibe in the studio wasn't as good, and 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 we couldn't get into Sound City to to record all the record. I think we may have done a little bit at Sound City of of Circus, and uh, and we were at A and M, and and A and M was a lot. Even though it was a beautiful studio, a fantastic studio, it wasn't that shabby comfort of of Sound City and. Uh, and you had to work harder to get a sound at A&M as well. So, uh, you know, but the blues and, and Welcome to Sky Valley were, 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 were fantastic to make. The only thing with Sky Valley is when we were done tracking drums, uh, Brant quit the band. So that, that was a drag. You know, I, I remember where I was standing in that studio that day and uh, when he made the announcement. And so... You know that that was the only only thing in, about that record that was a uh, a shabby memory, I think. But um, aside from that, you know, um, they they played fantastic on, on both of those records, and uh, very proud of it. It's it's recorded like unbelievably well, and uh, there's such a difference between blues and Sky Valley. Uh, as far as the bass EQ and the way it sounds, they're both incredible. I do have a question as far as the bass goes. Uh, you had Nick in there for uh, Blues for the Red Sun, 
And then Scott comes in uh, for Sky Valley. Any, you know, but you're still at Sound City. Everything else is the same. Uh, any, any, um, any input on the difference between those two? <clears throat> um, Nick was more fun. You know what I mean? <laughs> he still I, is I, a lot I of fun. <laughs> Scott's a sweetheart, but Nick, you know, Nick's wild. You know, and and he was just the same back then. I mean, if if there was anyone you could hear laughing above the din, it was Nick. Uh, walking down the hallway with his pants falling down. He had really long hair at the time, and and Nick was just precious, you know. So yeah, that 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 you know that Nick factor, the which, which is like, <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, you know, if you can imagine Nick when he was I don't know eighteen or nineteen years old, and uh, so you know, and Scott, great bass player. Uh, the same ilk of bass playing, you know, that really great, almost, you know, British geezer butler style of bass playing. And uh, so, you know, both really good players, but uh, personality slightly different. Scott was probably a little bit more worried than Nick was, you know. Uh, Scott's more of like, you know, uh, a little more concerned about things, but... You know, both of them were fine to work with. Them, and, yeah, know. both of them are just so amazing. Like, yeah, they really are. So incredible. individual. Yeah, um, great songwriting, great parts. You know, they don't just do yep. what else is out there. So um, let me ask you, where are you located right now, Chris? Do you, you live down in the valley? Do you live in uh, in no, I've been in Joshua Tree for nearly 20 years now. Nice. Yeah, I was just down there for the um, for Stone and Dusted. Uh, you just had a big show in Yucca Valley. How'd that go? It went really well, man. Um I, I walked into a, a, a new place called Gaudis, G-A-D-I-S, in Yucca Valley about four months ago, and uh, I it it was a it was a couple of restaurants over the years that I never went into, and I had no idea. I just why well, I, I knew they were having bands there, and I walked in to see what the room was like, and it's like a 400 capacity room, and all made out of wood. An absolutely beautiful live room, and uh, so I, you know, I don't know if you need the whole story, but yeah, let it rip. I played Pappy's many times, and they're lovely up there. And uh, but indoors, you have to be right, right in front of the stage to see anything. It always sounds good, but as far as visuals go, which to me, i you know, as a performer, I really like, you know, the idea that a whole room could see you, you know, from fifty feet away and hear you as well. And um, so anyway, I walked into this place and went, oh, shit, I'm playing here. And so uh, long story short, yeah, we uh, chose this place and really happy I did. Um, and uh, it rocked. Yeah, we I had, a, we was had great. a great crowd and uh, had a great time. So... Um, and and I was really happy because we need a second venue up here now. You know, it's a, a you know it's a, it's very trendy to come here, so why not you know yeah. um, provide music for all these people from around the world who are coming to the high desert now? And so there's another good venue uh, along with Pappy and Harriet. So um, yeah, I was glad to kind of like you know uh, break the ice there. I think. They had one other band that, that was that like uh, metal rap band that did "Come Come My Lady," whoever they were. What was I don't know. I I'm not sure who name, that is. But I know. Uh, they, I know Arthur C said he was gonna. He said something up there, and he yeah, said he yeah, said the I same think thing. He did, yeah. yeah. And so there's, um, you know, I was like really, I'm very very happy that there's another venue. Awesome. And uh, and the capacity is really good for. You know, bands that are, you know, breaking and, you know, and want the, need a 300 capacity room, three or 400 capacity room, and uh, maybe, a, you know, a few bands playing there. And, and once the place gets rolling, it's going to be something. And um, considering, you know, like getting involved with it and uh, to, to get the right kind of music into the venue. You know, we don't want, you know, thrash or anything like that, man. You know, it, it's, 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 it's more, it's, it, it would like 
you know, there, there's a certain kind of, of heavy music. Like, you know, Caius is, is, is one of them where there's a hippie slant to it, you know, and I guess that's where the stoner thing comes into. And then there's the just the drunken beer metal thing, which, you know, Caius had more intelligence than that. And so that, that you know, the kind of music I would bring in there would be more, you know, stoner music, I think, and, uh, and not kids are going to be fucking, you know, hurting each other, man. Right. You know, like, I, 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 I really used to like to see shows and not worried about getting hit in the head with a boot. Yeah. You know, um, I, I like to actually close my eyes and listen to music. And when, when a band is playing and you can't do that because you have to keep your eye out, you know, before you get, like, slammed by someone, you know, in the head, by their head or whatever, I don't have a good time, you know, yeah, we're not, for that shit. Yeah, we're not getting any younger, that's for sure. No, no, I mean, it, it, even, even, you know, for young people, I mean... I came, you know, from an era when, when I was a kid where, you know, if you saw Led Zeppelin play and they were doing the acoustic segment of their set, the room was silent, you know? I mean, when Jimmy Page was playing acoustic guitar, you know, people respected it. Yep. And now that silence is like this opportunity to yell. Yeah, take selfies. Know, and, and get your, your, ugly, your ugly voice in on... Like, oh, here's a moment where I can be, you know, on YouTube saying, play some fucking rock and roll, you know, really loud, you know, and, and just be a jerk. It's like the, the, the era of opportunist jerks right now. And, I agree. And so there is, you know, you can see good heavy music and, and soft music in the same show if, the, if you have a crowd that's respectful of you. And that's what kind of freaks me out now. I see prog bands like, you know, like I'm an old prog fuck from years ago. I'd love to go see Yes and, and you know, and, and music can be played at a whisper sometimes. And and you see it in L.A. especially. And 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 the rudeness of the audience just, just it makes me cringe. I feel so embarrassed for the for the band. Like, oh, my God. I would have walked off stage, you know, and so, you know, I, I rarely go to shows in L.A. for that reason, because it, it's like the Different worst deal. town for that, you well, know, like, here's my opportunity, you know, and, um, but anyway, I'm stoked. whatever. I'm you stoked know, you had, um, I'm stoked you had a positive tip, and uh, that's it, brother. I'm stoked you had a good show there, man, that's great, because that's good news for anybody else who's coming through there. Well, bef before, yeah, before yeah, I let you was, go. It was wonderful, man. I, I've never had a nicer crowd come to the show. I mean, everyone was so lovely, you know. I mean, that's really, awesome. It was, One of my um, buddies drove all the way down from the. He went down from the bay. My friend iMac was there with Jason and everybody. They had. A, they said it was incredible. Crazy, you know. People flew in from Canada, from awesome, from New York, from uh, Connecticut, Texas. I mean, people came from all over North America to see the show. Well, let me ask you a and, question. And, and it's so humbling, man. You know that. So much spend that much time to, and money to come in effort, yeah, to go all the way out to uh, see a show. So yeah, and, and everyone was absolutely lovely. Not one jerk, really. You know, awesome. So yeah, I, I had a really great time. Everyone was fantastic to the band. Well, listen, Chris. Before I let you go, I do have a question. What are you playing? And I do this to all the artists when they come on, so I apologize. But what are you playing, man? Is that like a modified Fender? Like, what do you got up there? What what, what guitar are you playing through? Five telecast. Oh, so it's an old telly. Okay. And yeah, that's a Frankenstein that I've, you know, ripped up a million times and changed over the years. But the last time it was touched was 1984. Wow, it sounds and, amazing. And, and that's the way it is now, the way it was done in 1984. All right. And uh, what amps are you using? Uh, I use 100-watt Marshall when I can, um, when I'm, you know, able to, to bring my 100-watt Marshalls to a show, which I did at, at Gaddy's. That's what I use. Awesome. Well, then, uh, one more last, you know, kind of like a, like a big journalistic question, but if, if I look at this list of bands you've worked with, you know, Slow Burn and Screaming Trees and Ian Asbury and The Cult and Nebula and stuff, is there any way you could tell me through all this the, most, uh, the, the thing you're the most proud of? Um, 
I mean, obviously, I think, you know, Caius has to be at the top of the list. Um, and and the, the work I did with Ginger Baker, uh, and more recently the work I've done with Uncle, the electronic band from uh, the U.K., and, um, yeah, so it just keeps going. I it mean, does. What, what's that, the next uh, thing for producing? What are you producing next? Um, let's see. Well, I, I mixed the John Garcia album, which, which I, I didn't record, but I mixed it. Um, next is my own stuff, I believe. Um, well, I am going to be working, you know, there's uh, the, the girls who run La Copine Restaurant here. Uh, one of them is a musician. I'm going to be doing some work with her. Her name is Claire Wadsworth. Her and her sister sang backup vocals for us uh, last week. And um, but uh, I'm I'm writing. I have over 200 songs now. Wow. So um, still writing and and uh, you know negotiating some some possible record deals and. Uh, and possibly putting some shows and a possible tour together for 2020. Wow. And uh, so right now, there's no Masters of Reality shows set up, but something coming in 2020? Um, maybe in autumn. I'm not sure it's being talked about or feeling. See, I finally have someone who's like, you know, like who, who stepped forward and said, you know, you need someone to manage your affairs because... Uh, I'm the, like the worst businessman in the world. Yeah, I really am. We can only do so much stuff. So uh, yeah, I, I if if the art I make sells, it's fantastic. I do well in business, but as far as like you know, like yeah, anything beside that, no. And uh, so yeah, finally have someone who's uh, who's fielding stuff for me because you know I I can't talk business. I I, I don't move. trust anybody and. Uh, and I'm very, very, you know, uh, possessive with my art, and uh, so I'm careful with it. And so uh, I gotta, I gotta feel love from somebody before I let them handle me. And in any case, uh, yeah, I'll be around, man. Dude, uh, Chris, I know you don't. Um, I, we're speaking to Chris Goss, by the way, of Masses of Reality, uh, world famous producer. Chris, I know you don't do a lot of this stuff. So from me and everybody at Caius World. I really want to just say we thank you very much, man. I know it was a big deal to get out, get go out of your way and do all this. So thank you very much. Well, I appreciate it, man. Thank you guys for keeping music alive, and uh, we'll see you out there. Next time you're in San Francisco, I'll see you here, man. Thank you, Chris. You got it, brother. Have a good one, man. Ciao. Chris Goss on Caius World Radio.